One day, Jesus of Nazareth is hung on the cross, friendless, forsaken, and alone. His death itself was a scandal and a shame, a cruel and a violent death to be hung on a cross. One of the really most debilitating or degrading ways to die, especially uh, in that time during the first century. Uh, the death that he experienced on the cross is a death that is reserved for rebels, for slaves, and for criminals. And that day Caesar scored the biggest name on the Roman blacklist, Jesus, the King of the Jews. But it is very strange, and I want to borrow your attention for a moment, it's very strange. Because a few days later, after he's hung on the cross, he is worshipped by thousands as the Son of God. Something must have happened in between. In between him being hung on the cross and then a few days being heralded and hailed as the Son of God. Something in fact did happen. And we celebrate and chronicle what occurred even today. He rose from the dead. When he hung on the cross, he was alone. But yet within 50 years, there was a church to worship in that referenced his name in every major city in the Roman Empire. One day, the disciples are huddled in fear for their lives in an upper room with doors and windows barred. And then a few days later, they're out on the streets proclaiming that Jesus was God and defying all the opposition that organized government and religion could bear. Something had happened. And what happened was a significant change in everything that they saw. Jesus rose from the dead. When we talk about the gospel, and I'm going to reiterate it again, the gospel is good news. Gospel is good news. And when we broke it down, we explained that gospel is good news, opportunity, salvation, peace, everlasting love. Now, there is a distinction between good news and good advice. Good advice is a suggestion. News is an announcement. Something significant has happened. And as a result, things will now be different. So the cry that they gave, I want you to hear me for a moment, that God has raised him from the dead is now the greatest news the world has ever heard. So let's really look at some basic assumptions of the gospel. Go to verse number 9 in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. If you confess with your mouth, everybody say confess. confess, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you confess with your mouth. So number one, it's important for us to understand this. Number one, we must give a public testimony. A public testimony. If you confess with your mouth, this is some real basic stuff, somewhat of a recipe for salvation. He says, if you confess with your mouth, so it is a public testimony, and believe in your heart. So not only am I confessing with my mouth, but I must believe with my heart. And this is really, really the essence of this because it's very important. Because uh, you can confess something with your, with your mouth and not believe it in your heart. You see it all the time. You see it all the time in popular culture, in media, uh, in movies, television. You look at this, someone looks at her and he says, oh, I love you. You know he don't love her, but he says it. He confesses with his mouth, but doesn't believe it in his heart. Because if you confess it in your mouth and believe it in your heart, then an action takes place. You can demonstrate it. You can show me. Amen. 
And so it is not just uh, confessing with the mouth, but it's also believing in the heart. So we move from a public testimony to a personal trust. A personal trust. A personal trust. One of the challenges today in a social uh, media uh, culture uh, is that we are very quick to form and build relationships. And as a result of that, uh, relationships are built, but they have not been tested. And whenever a relationship is not tested, it cannot be trusted. And so uh, the challenge is, is that we call everyone our friend. You know, did you friend me on this? Or did you like me on this? And so we, we, we move very swiftly uh, without really being able to build trust. Because trust takes time to build. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. But notice it is not just enough for him to confess with his mouth and to believe with his heart. It's not enough for us just to do that. He says that God has raised him from the dead. So we move from a public testimony, a personal trust, to a proven truth. A public testimony, a personal trust, to a proven truth. Stay with me. That God has raised him from the dead. God has raised him from the dead. And he says to him to believe. Everybody shout believe. believe. This word believe here is very important for us to understand because it's the foundation of where we find the word faith. It expresses reliance upon. We rely upon it. We build it. We trust in it. So we move from uh, these basic things of assumptions of the gospel to now the blessed assurance of the gospel. Because it says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you what? You shall be saved. You shall be saved. You shall be saved. That is the assurance of the gospel. That when I confess, when I believe, what am I believing? That God has raised him from the dead. That he is Lord over my life. Lord meaning sovereign over my life. He takes control over my life. Then I receive the assurance that I shall be saved. So, so, so if, we, if, we, if we really look at what the scripture says as to what salvation denotes and what salvation requires, then a lot of what we see in common culture and a lot of what we see pervaded in reality television as Christianity is false. Because they confess it, don't believe it, nor model it. Now, they may not get a lot of amen, but it's true. Amen. Okay? Confession is powerful. The word confess literally is a binding public declaration, which is a legal relation, literally is contractually established. So when I confess something, I am, I am making a contract on my behalf, or on my side. Uh, and notice this verse includes to repent from sin. Trusting in Christ for salvation and submitting to his lordship. It is the volitional element of faith. And I want to really break this down to them because it's very important for us to understand. We're going to go some places in a minute. When we say we believe, it means we trust. When you believe someone, you trust them. When you believe something, you trust them. To rely on, to have faith in. So this requires us to move from just having a saving faith to an active faith. To an active faith. When we confess, we declare, we confirm, and we seal the beliefs in our heart. I believe it was uh, years ago Bishop Kurt Courtney talked about uh, whenever you are building trust, you are to build it in layers. And just as the tabernacle has the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies, that there should be layers to the relationships that you build uh, in allowing people to have access to who you are. And, 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 and that is very critical and very crucial uh, because when you believe, you open yourself to understanding. So active faith consists of the following. Number one, mental. Mental. The mind understands the gospel and the truth about Christ. Mental. Number two, emotional. One embraces the truthfulness of those facts with sorrow over sin and joy over God's mercy and grace. And I've said repeatedly, and we dealt some with grace last week, 
uh, grace, the grace of God uh, gives us that which we what? Don't deserve. The mercy of God keeps back from us that which we do deserve. Okay? So, so we understand uh, that act of faith is mental, it's emotional, but it's also volitional. We must submit our will to Christ and trust in Him alone as the hope of salvation. When you see all this stuff that's going on, uh, especially even as recent as uh, recent of uh, this week, uh, all of the hashtags that's been going on with all the things that are happening and so many people. Uh, recently, the young lady that is up in the news now, I, I can't remember if it was, of course, uh, they said it was suicide, but it might have been something else and all of that, and they tried to do the social justice. Sandra Bland, you know what I'm talking about. When you see all these things that are happening, uh, it reminds us that we really, despite all the stuff that we see in media, despite of everything that's going on, we really have only one hope. Yeah. And that is in Christ. Yeah. And, and, and no matter what we see politically, no matter what we see socially, no matter what we see in every indicator of society and culture, uh, uh, everyone is trying to figure out what to do, but the solution and the answer is already here. Our hope is to be anchored in Jesus. Okay. Uh, so genuine faith will always produce authentic obedience. Genuine faith will always produce authentic obedience. I've said before that life is a matrix of patterns and principles. And we often hear sometimes salvation. We hear about salvation, we want to be saved and make decisions and all of that. But salvation is much more than just baptism and church membership. There are many teachings about salvation, but Jesus is the only way. And see, we hear a lot of times today, uh, uh, today in our time, that Jesus is a way, a suggestion. You should try Jesus. You should try church. Or if you don't work for you, you can go try and do that, or you can go do that, or you can go do all that, invent yourself like a pretzel and do all that stuff. You know, you can try these different things. And so we try all these different things, uh, but we must understand, Jesus says in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, the light. No man comes to the Father except by me. He's not a good suggestion. It's not good advice. It's news. Something significant has happened. And as a result, things will now be different. And then Acts 4 and 12 says there's only one name whereby all men might be saved. That the name of Jesus. Okay? So, when we understand this, let's really get some clarity on the pattern of salvation. Because in verse number 9, he says that we must what? Confess with our mouths. So number one, we must understand confession. Confession. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'll show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, let's look at this real quick. Verse 13. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, for you are still in your sins. Verse 19. If this if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now notice in verse 20 he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits are the first ripened part of a harvest. Okay? And so his resurrection is our promise. And so what we must understand is that in verse 9 of, Act, of Romans chapter 10, it teaches us to confess and confession. But in verse 10, in verse 10, it enables us to understand what is required for conversion. What is required for conversion. So this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And it's important for us to understand this. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, God is the only one that can change the human heart. And that's the challenge. Because it is in our nature to want to change people. Amen. It's in our nature to want to change people. You know, you want them to change. You know, everybody in some way of shape or form 
want someone to, to oblige in some way, shape, or form to how they think, see, feel, or experience. But the Holy Spirit is the only one that can change the human heart. You can change a law and not change a heart. It is the Holy Spirit that transforms and changes a heart. So when we understand confession, verse number 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, Romans 10. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So conversion comes with the heart. Believing in heart and mind brings action. So when my heart and my mind are in alignment, then I begin to move out and walk out the changed life that I have received. Amen. The changed life that I have received. A new heart. I'm going to say a new heart. A new heart. You see, it's in Ezekiel chapter 36. And I want to really stop and take some time to really explain this because a lot of times we get confused. And, and I have people that hit me up all the time online that watch us and, and all of that that ask me questions about this stuff because, you know, they see some someone on television or some reality show or something and it's not adding up and well I thought you Christians do this and I, I said well that's not everyone that's, that's some people you know but uh, Ezekiel 36 and 26 says I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh so he's saying I'm going to transform your heart that's what we really need we need we need heart transformation heart transplant uh, the gospel transforms your heart changes who you are, changes your nature. Things that used to interest you, things that used to excite you at one place at one point, when you fully understand who Christ is and what he has done for you, it transforms you. So when we look at this, when we look at this in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 shows us confession. I want you to get this down. Confession. Verse number 10 shows us conversion. Conversion. But then, in verse 11 and 12, we see a concept. A concept. A concept. That's what it says. For the scriptures say, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. So we move from verse number 9, confession, to verse number 10, conversion. I'm almost there. And then in verse 11 and verse 12, we see a concept. Because we have to understand that salvation is for all people. You remember a couple weeks ago I shared when we were starting out this series that what we see today in ISIS and what we see in Charleston and what we see in there, all these different things is a result of sin. Sin is the real problem. Someone hit me up this week and asked me to give my commentary of thoughts for an article they were trying to do on racism and all of that. Sin at the root is the issue of everything that we're seeing. Okay, and we have to understand salvation as a concept is meant that when Christ has come into our lives, something significant has happened to you. Can someone in this place testify that when you came to the knowledge of who Jesus is, something in you changed? You might have had the same clothes on, you might have had the same hairdo, might have had the same shoes, but there was an inward transformation of your heart in which you knew things would never be the same again. People looked at you that you've known for years and said, something different about you. Because he comes in and he transforms our hearts. And then verse number 13. Verse 13 says, for whoever calls, so whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, so, so let's really get to the essence of the gospel then. And this is really where I want to lay. He says, whosoever shall call. So verse number 9 is a confession. Verse number 10 is a conversion. Then we look at verses 11 and 12. It is a concept. But in verse 13 he says, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In 1 John 1 and 9, one of my favorite scriptures, 1 John 1 and 9, uh, 1 John 1 and 9 he says, um, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Calling them on the name of the Lord and confession are tied together. So let's move 
Let's move on. We'll move Let's move to the essence of the gospel. Here before me. All of this is reduced to a call. All of this is reduced to a call. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This verse reduces the gospel to its simplest possible terms. A call. Anyone can call. On your phone, you have a button. You can click, call. A little child can call. Simon Peter illustrates in the Gospels. While he's walking on the waves toward Christ, marveling how wonderful it is to walk on the waves. And suddenly he begins to sink. And he begins to cry out, Lord, save me, a call. There's nothing logical, no philosophical arguments, no debate, just a call. That is the essence of the gospel. Call on Jesus. And somebody might say, oh, that, that's, that's old-fashioned. We don't need that stuff today. Well, if you look at all that's going on, you really will end up calling on Jesus. Amen. If you turn around every five, six, Amen. seven minutes, I mean, the, the entire week this week, it seems as if... Uh, um, the bad news just keeps piling on top of each other. 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 Blood here. Blood there. Blood there. Someone got shot here. Someone got shot there. Someone got cut there. Someone got stabbed there. It's like everywhere you turn it, we watch nothing but hospital runs. Okay? And, 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 and it requires us to return back, like I said last week, to the throne of grace. The throne of grace. The throne of grace. So, it, so the gospel is reduced to a call. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's really, let's really understand this. So, so the first thing we see here is the scope of the gospel. Whosoever, everyone, anyone, wherever you are, whoever calls is the scope of the gospel. No matter how wealthy you might be, no matter how impoverished you may think you are, no matter where you find yourself, on any ladder you put yourself, whoever you are can call. That is the scope of the gospel, whoever. But then the simplicity of the gospel is the call itself. So no matter where you find yourself, no matter anything that's going on, I remember years ago, a lady named Evangelist Bates that came out of my grandfather's church many years ago was in the uh, World Trade Center towers when they were uh, getting ready to uh, fall. And she was inside of the building. And she, she escaped, she survived. Thank God she's alive even now. And, and uh, when she was coming out of the building, coming out of the building, because you know the buildings were in flames, they were going down. And she made it out the building, and she fell on the outside of the building. And people were running, they were scared, they were running. And people were literally running on top of her. And while they were running on top of her, she, she literally could have died just for being trampled over. A lot of people died that escaped just Amen. because they didn't, they couldn't walk or move after her. And all of a sudden, she said she cried out to God, and, and she didn't even know what happened. Someone lifted her up. And when she got up, she looked, there was no one there. And, 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 and all she did was cry out to God. There's something about when you yes. cry out to God. Even when you're not sure what's going yes. to happen. Even when you're not sure about what's going on. Yes. There's something about when your heart begins to cry mm -hmm. out to God. There were people in those towers, atheists, and they're all in between. And she said, people screaming out, God, save me. Yes. said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There was a man that was on the cross by the side of Jesus. And he looked over to him. And while he looked over to him, he looked over to him. And Jesus looked at him and said, this day you shall be in paradise. Whoever calls yes. upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. And, and so we understand the scope of the gospel is whosoever. The simplicity of the gospel is to call. Matter of fact, the power of being called or calling is so important that Jesus himself calls when he calls the church. It is the called out ones. We've been called out from darkness. We've been called out of this despair. We've been called out of things that have happened. And we have now been transformed to the image of his son. So when Christ looks at us, when we pray, he does not see all the stuff we've done, all the things we've been at, and all the things that have happened in our lives. But he looks at us through the lens of the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us and makes us white as snow. Because we've been called out. So look at someone tell them, I've been called out. Whether somebody calls my name or not, I've been called out. Hallelujah. And so we understand the scope of the gospel is whosoever. The call the simplicity of the gospel is to call. 
but then we understand the substance of the gospel is that whoever calls shall be saved. Saved from what? You know, we say, oh, I'm saved. From what? Some folks say, they say, they say from nothing. So what are we saved from? We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved from the power of sin. We are saved from the presence of sin. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sarah, you said you're saved, but I saw you do this yesterday. And all that. Yeah, uh, uh, that might have happened, but it's not in my nature. Why? Because I've called out to him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so now, uh, when these things happen, when something happens, and of course, you know, every now and then you'll have moments and things will come about, but that doesn't make you lose your salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm talking about the cheap grace here. You do what you want to do and feel good and all that. I'm not talking about that. Okay. But what I'm saying is, is that uh, you don't allow condemnation or guilt to cause you to feel as if you have lost something from God. Because you didn't gain it. You can't save yourself. Yes. Hallelujah. You can't save yourself. And, and, and we have to understand what the Word of God teaches us and, and when we really get clarity on it, He says, whoever calls my name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm saved from the penalty of sin. I'm saved from the power of sin. I'm saved from the presence of sin. I 